Thank you. Thank you. Greetings and welcome to the first post P. I'm going to say P for the live stream algorithm, right? So we don't want to trip them up. Post P installment of Biohack the World. I'm, my name is David Choi. I'm the executive producer of Biohack the World. I'm so excited to have you all here. Thank you so much. I'm honored by, by your presence. In case you're new to biohacking or to Biohack the World, the series, uh, our mission here is to create a cleaner, safer, more judicious and equitable place for all of us to not only live, grow and prosper, but to help others do the same through the education of our biology, our microbiology, our psychology and our environment. And what we aim to provide here is nothing less than what is on the bleeding edge of anti-aging, nutritional, and exercise science today. We're gathered here because we love to nerd out about this exquisite system that we've all been bestowed with. A system that works best when we are working, living, and learning harmoniously in concert with each other. And tonight is no different. We're gonna be diving real deep into Alzheimer's prevention, and all the best ways to detox our brains in 2021 and beyond. And I feel like this is an especially expedient topic given the circumstances and everything that's been going on and pee-induced emotional and mental distress, right? So, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have a mom at home and she's going through her thing with dementia and well, I, I feel like there isn't anyone on this planet that isn't somehow one or two degrees away from uh, or, or separated from somebody who's suffering from a neurodegenerative condition. So if, that's, uh, if that resonates with you, this talk is for you. So whether or not you are biohacking to offset some of the bad from drinking one too many quarantinis or you're trying to gain a competitive edge, you've come to the right place because this is where the best of the best health enthusiasts in New York City come to gather and grow. Okay, so with that said, biohacking. How many here would identify as a biohacker? Raise your hand. That is a tremendous amount of you. I would say that's 80 to 90% of this crowd. Thank you so much. Anyone wanna call out some of your favorite biohacks? Sleep, great sleep. Okay, anything else? What? Meditation, of course. We did a show on meditation. What's that? Gut health. gut health. Everything has everything to do with your gut microbiome. I love to say that. Um, okay, so great. And the other thing that we're going to get into is fasting. So we're going to be talking about fast mimicking, protein fast, um, and all that relates to longevity and, and brain span, right? So does anyone want to share their longest fast? Anyone? 24 hours? Three days. Three days. Amazing. Anyone? else? I made it to 36, but I, uh, I, my wife and I, we do a, a daily 20 hour fast. We do one, one meal a day. So I think that, that uh, counts for something, something big. Um, all right. So amazing. You guys are all win it, in it to win it. We're going to move on. And uh, before we do, I just some housekeeping. Uh, I'd like everyone to turn your phones to silent. And if you want to make dad especially proud, you go into airplane mode. All right, so we're gonna bring up our first speaker tonight. She's a very special lady, a uh, good friend of mine, dear friend of mine. Her name is Michelle Shapiro. She's a registered dietitian. She's gonna give us some tips and tricks about longevity, uh, fasting, sorry, fasting, fast mimicking, and on our title sponsor, Daily Dose. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Shapiro. <laughs> So I am fake Trisha tonight. Trisha is the owner of Daily Dose, which is an incredible meal delivery service. They use pasture-raised, grass-fed, organic um, food. And I'm actually going to start, um, I'll, I'll talk about who I am later, but um, I'm going to start by talking about Daily Dose because um, I am fake Trisha today. Um, so Daily Dose meals um, are, you can get like different meal services, um, meal plans with them basically. And I just wanted to touch on a personal story of what's been happening in my life and how Trisha and Daily Dose have made my life so much better. Um, so I recently had a very dear family of mine diagnosed with stage four glioblastoma. Um, there, we are obviously um, a harsh diagnosis. Of course, we have, my family's been like chickens with their heads cut off trying to make sure everything um, is good. The first thing I thought of was like, what food can I get to at least make sure that everything she's eating is super clean? And I looked like immediately went first to Trisha. Um, and so 
again, it's like the ease of that for our family um, has been so amazing, and the meals have come out like perfect every single time, and she's getting a, like all these balances of amazing nutrients, um, and I was really grateful and excited to share that with everyone because um, Trisha's made my life easier during a time when our lives were not easy at all. Um, so much respect to Trisha for that. She has a variety of different um, daily doses, a lot of different meal plans um, and offerings, and a lot of them are based on longevity, overall health. Um, and we were going to talk a, a little bit today about the protein sparing, fasting mimicking plan. Um, and so I wanted to just preface that a little bit, and then I'll tell you about myself. Um, I am an integrative registered dietitian here in New York, born and raised, Queens. Nice. But now I'm in Manhattan, Queens people. Um, and uh, I help clients deal with um, long-term gut and uh, the holistic reversal of anxiety disorders. Um, food is obviously at the premiere of the work that I do. And for Trisha especially, um, something that was really important that she wanted to emphasize is that she believes that food is medicine. And anytime you're looking at any sort of treatment, um, she always wants us to look at food first before you look at other treatments um, as the primary um, treatment method. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the protein sparing, protein fasting plan. Um, so <laughs> David's a big fasting person. Um, fasting can be done in a lot of different ways. And this is obviously all of us here know it. But for people who are on the live stream, this is, could be important and amazing biohacking information too. Um, so you can achieve fasting through the length of time you're fasting, or you can restrict the amount of calories or the amount of protein or the amount of carbs that you're eating. So one way that um, has been popularized is this kind of prolonged fasting program, um, which limits uh, the amount of calories and protein that you're eating so that you're eating food, but you're still getting the advantages of fasting and autophagy. And so your body can kind of reset your metabolism and you know eat away the stuff internally that I know Avisha and Dr. Isaacson are going to talk in depth about too. Um, the really cool thing uh, about Trisha's plan is that, and Daily Dose's plan, I keep saying Trisha, again, she's the owner of it, um, is that you can eat real food while doing it. Prolon, I know for my clients, I serve over 500 clients in the New York City area. They want actual food, like they're eating the packets of Prolon. It's very not enticing, especially if you want to do it for like month by month for the first five days of the month. Um, it's, it becomes like really monotonous. Um, sorry, Prolon. Um, and amazing company. But um, I think it's, there's something to be said about not being having to think about the exact calories, protein, and everything and get the advantages of it while eating real food. Um, so that plan is amazing of hers. Um, we'll talk also about what tonight, um, what the benefits of fasting are um, more in depth. Um, but I wanted to, since I'm fake Trisha, emphasize a lot of what Trisha's plans can do, um, specifically for people who are looking to achieve those goals and what an advantage it is to have actual real food that tastes freaking amazing. Um, I'm, I'm pitching it back to you, unless you have specific questions or anything. Freaking yes. amazing. Yes. I love that. It, and it, thank you so much. And I had it, um, the five day protein fast. It, it was like no protein. It wasn't, like when I opened it up, I was like, this is beautiful. And then. I realized that I wasn't going to be eating much now. But it, it was satiating. I actually didn't feel like I was starving through this whole thing. So please, um, people at home, please feel free to try it out. Daily Dose, uh, the protein fast. OK, so now for the main event. I'm so excited to bring to the stage your host for tonight. His name is Avisha Nasaiber, And he's going to give us a very special talk titled The Hidden Health Hazards of human habitats. All right, that's it. Try to say that a hundred times fast. Um, so <laughs> please help me welcome to the stage alliteration wizard and chief science officer, Avisha Nasaiber. I do have a mic. Look, Ma, no hands. All right, thank you, David. And welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. So excited to be here, both with all of you in person and everyone joining live. It honestly is so energizing to be back in a room full of people for the first time in who knows how long, seeing all the smiling faces without any fake backgrounds, breathing the same air without the same level of fear that we've had over the course of the last year. But we actually might want to hold on to just a little bit of that fear and use it as a motivator. Yeah, you laugh. But Unfortunately, the air that we breathe really is not as safe as we would like and can contribute towards some unfortunate side effects. So what I want you all to do right now is just quickly 
take a deep breath through your nose and try to pay attention to everything that you can smell, all those things that you were not paying attention to before. As you do that, look around and think, what are the elements of the environment that you're in that might be impacting what you are currently breathing in? The nose is really amazing in its ability to detect even individual molecules. And yet, we did not evolve to detect many types of compounds. Human evolution began millions of years ago, and we evolved to be fast, strong, smart, resilient, able to adapt to the most stressful environments from deserts to rainforests to Arctic glaciers. And yet, we did not evolve for an office surrounded by cars and factories and full of Brenda's latest air freshener. That is something that is totally foreign to our biology. And it's really this disconnect between our modern environment and that environment that we did evolve in, evolve in that is central to so many of the health issues that we face these days. If we could solve that, then we would go a great step towards being healthier. But we were talking about the nose. The nose evolved to detect threats, to detect wild animals, poisonous foods, rotten foods, gases, things that we might encounter in that ancestral environment. But in the modern office or home, there are so many different compounds that are invisible, scentless, and yet have a significant negative impact on our health. And I want to go over some of them with you. So to start, we've got our basic pollution, particulate matter. PM 2.5 particles is what they're often referred to as. 2.5 being the size of the particle, 2.5 microns in diameter. That's 1 50th the size of a human hair. They're invisible, they're scentless, they're small enough to remain in the air for days, and they go into your lungs and cause significant oxidative damage. They can cause heart problems, lung problems, but it really doesn't stop there. The EPA defines a safe level of pollution as 12 micrograms per meters cubed. You can remember the number, forget the units. 12 is bad. Less than that, they say it's totally fine. And yet, we're starting to realize that really there is no safe level. A recent study found that looking at data from Medicare patients for pretty much the entire system, starting at zero, as you go up for every five micrograms per meters cubed, you get an increase in risk for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, neurodegenerative diseases, showing that this is damaging more than just our lungs and heart. It's damaging everything. It's damaging our nervous system. To put that number in perspective for you, last night when I was preparing to talk, I looked up what are the current pollution levels outside of New York. And that number was 18 micrograms per meter cubed. 18. That's enough to increase my risk by over 50% which is a lot smaller than some of the genetic factors in these diseases, but it's still significant. Thankfully, that was contrasted with my levels indoors, which were only four. But the sources of these contaminants are plentiful and yet narrow. The biggest source is combustion. Our cars outdoors cause more than half of these particles to go into the air. But we're not safe indoors either, because even just turning on our stoves fills the air with tons of toxic particles. And it doesn't stop at the particles, which brings me to the next category of contaminants. That's the gases, specifically the small gases. Every time you turn on that stove, it releases into the air carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, formaldehyde, yeah, the stuff that we use to mummify people with, or other things. You, I, you all know about the negative health impacts of carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, but nitrogen oxides are ones that are less talked about, and yet they're everywhere, unfortunately. If you've ever walked outside in a city that has smog, the smog is not the particulate matter. It's the nitrogen oxides that are actually impacting the way that the light is moving through them. And that goes into your lungs and irritates them, and it's not just your lungs. Because again, we have a study that was published just this past week that showed that nitrogen dioxide levels of more than 38 parts per billion are associated with increased risk for Parkinson's and dementia. They're affecting our nervous system. And again, perspective time, when I turn on the stove in my apartment, if the windows are not all open, my NO2 levels go in my room go up to over 200. That's a lot more than 38. And it's not just the small gases that are a problem. Volatile organic compounds are a whole class of gases that are including formaldehyde, but not limited to, that are released by 
all the different types of materials that we have in our homes. They're more than two to five times more prevalent indoors and outdoors. They're released by our building materials, our wood composites, our cleaners, our air fresheners. We put these things into the air and they go into our lungs and react with the lining and can actually cause all sorts of respiratory diseases. In, two, in 2019, there were 339 million cases of asthma diagnosed worldwide. Over 400,000 of these led to people dying, 400,000 deaths. But 339 million, that's more than double the global birth rate. We are not going in a good direction here. It, it's a problem. But speaking of going in the wrong direction, there is another contaminant that people are all aware of, and yet nobody really thinks about its negative health impacts. It's everywhere, but we never even consider it. Anyone know what I'm thinking about? No, no, no. Carbon dioxide. When we breathe out carbon dioxide, we increase the levels in our space. And again, in our ancestral environment, we evolved outdoors. We did not evolve to sit in boxes of our own exhalations, where those levels just skyrocket. Theoretically, all of our buildings should be designed to prevent the buildup of CO2, but rarely is this actually done properly. A recent study found that in schools, so normally outdoors, CO2 levels are around 400 parts per million, but schools usually start at around 1,000 and get up to above 3,000. Now, you might think, oh, this is no problem. OSHA says that 5,000 is the limit by at which point things become unhealthy. But that's if you don't care about your brain, which I think everyone here does. A study done here in New York actually found that when they took people and gave them a battery of cognitive tests while slowly increasing the CO2 levels in the room, going from 600 ppm to 1,000 was enough to significantly impact performance on six out of nine cognitive tasks. When they elevated that to 2,500 ppm, it made things way worse. This is still in the theoretically safe levels. And again, perspective, when I'm sitting at home in my room, if I close the door, close the window, Levels will go from 400 to over 1,000 in under half an hour because there is no mechanical ventilation. So therefore, I sit there with a CO2 monitor, and as soon as it hits over 600, I crack open the window and start letting in some fresh air, but also the contaminants that come with it. But thankfully, we do have things that can help. Technology giveth, technology taketh away. Filters are able to go and remove airborne contaminants. HEPA filters are the most common type we talk about, and they do a good job at removing airborne particulates. But they're generally not sized properly for the space, so if you have one, odds are it's not doing as good a job as you would hope. We can add on to that activated carbon filters that go and can take those VOCs and slowly pull them out of the air. In more recent years, we've actually experimented with ways to enhance those activated carbon filters by adding on compounds like potassium and magnesium that actually allow them to absorb or adsorb the really small gas is like nitrogen dioxide and ozone, which is another big problem. But again, it's all about getting the right size for a space rather than something that just looks pretty. And there are even more advanced technologies using processes called photocatalytic, oxi photocatalytic oxidation that are able to go and sort of recreate the natural outdoor processes that you would find in the cleaning mechanism of the atmosphere and fill your indoor space with compounds that are able to break down VOCs continuously in the air. And they can actually even puncture the membranes of viruses and bacteria and help prevent those from spreading in case that's of interest to anyone, which yeah, sometimes these days. But then you've got CO2, which is a little bit of a trickier situation because none of these filters will deal with carbon dioxide. That's sort of like what everything turns into. And it would be great if we could just open up that window and let in the fresh air, but we live in New York and the fresh air isn't as fresh as we would like it to be. But I, there's the rub for in that breath of air, what toxicants may come when we must shuffle off our mortal coil. So instead, we do actually have technologies that can help. Because we've been researching for the purposes of global warming, carbon sequestration methods, which can actually take millions of tons of carbon, pull them out of the air, and get them sequestered in various different ways. Most of these have not made their way into air purification technologies yet, but hopefully soon. But Really what I want to close with is the idea that these are all stopgap measures. These are temporary. We don't want to have to rely on technologies to put things into the air and remove them from the air. Instead, it would be much better if we could just not put them in the air in the first place, if we could move away from the combustion engine, if we could stop 
using toxic chemicals in all of our building materials, all of our paint. Stop spraying it in pesticides from planes. And instead, if we could go and take our indoor environments, our planet, and return them more to that, to resemble that outdoor ancestral environment that we evolved to handle in and be healthy in, then we could actually not only extend our lifespan, but extend our health span and brain span. And that's what we really want to focus on tonight. It's not just the environment, it's every aspect of our lives. It's what we eat, it's what we do, and air is just one piece of the puzzle. And we have here with us today someone who really is a puzzle master in this regard. Dr. Richard Isaacson is one of the premier Alzheimer researchers in the world. He is the well, founder and director of the Alzheimer Prevention Clinic, right? That's what it's called? Yeah, prevention, not just random treatment. He can actually work to help you stop it from happening in the first place. The, let's see, director of faculty development at Weill Cornell Medicine, the assistant prof or associate professor of neurology, and a full CV that is actually longer than my speech, so I'm not going to go into all of it. But some of the really cool aspects are even created an online resource that is a whole university for Alzheimer's education that is amazing. And in clinical practice, he's pioneered methods of using precision medicine targeted to try and both stop Alzheimer's from happening and to help treat the early phases of it. He's even written some papers on using wearables, wearable biometrics, to help track, figure out where, like, who might be at risk, and maybe even do some uh, tight feedback loops for interventions to help really prevent them. So I am super excited to hear what he has to say. Why don't you all help me welcome to the stage Dr. Richard Isaacson. Well, that is a tough act to follow. Um, I'm chopped liver, and thank you so much. I appreciate that. The puzzle master, whoa, like, so cool. So thank you for the very kind introduction. David Warrior, thank you so much for, there you go. Thanks, brother. I appreciate the introduction and the, uh, the, the, the invitation. Um, it's really great to be here. First time, mask off, um, really cool. First time in public with people. I forgot what it's like to speak. Like I didn't even, I forgot to wear a belt. Like I don't even, I don't even know what's going on. I, I, I got socks. Um, anyway, um, first button down shirt in a year and a half. Like really weird. Um, flip flops in the bag. So thanks so much for being here. Am I supposed to wish, I'm going to look at you guys. Um, I, to, hello to people who are watching. Um, thank you for tuning in and learning. Um, I am an Alzheimer's prevention neurologist. Whoa, like what is that? Um, yes, it's 2021. It's okay to use the terms Alzheimer's and prevention in the same sentence. Uh, back in 2013, I founded the first uh, Alzheimer's prevention clinic in the United States and probably globally. Um, and back then I was getting tomatoes thrown at me. I was getting hit over the head with bone broth packages. <laughs> Whoever created the bone broth, high five. That was delicious. Where'd she go? There we go. Um, Cool. So, um, and thanks for Daily Dose, and thanks for everyone else for, for, for bringing me here today. So, um, I believe that it's possible for people today to take control of their brain health tomorrow. Full stop. Um, I was taught in medical school. I graduated 20 years ago. I'm like old now. Is Botox given in this environment? Like, do we have any? We have a cryotherapy place I heard about. Okay, cool. Cryo up there. Okay. Botox over there, whatever it takes. Um, I lived in Miami for 10 years, that was the anti-aging serum. But anyway, so I wasn't taught in medical school that like you can create new brain cells. Like that, that did you learn that in medical school? Like I, I no, no, right? Like, yeah, afterward, afterward, right? In medical school, like the brain kind of like developed and then it just like kind of degenerated. But uh, from my now understanding and lots of reading and, and learning from colleagues, um, we can create new brain cells. Again, full stop. That's cool. Um, we can take control of our aging processes. That's cool. Um, I never thought I'd be talking in a group of people that were interested in biohacking, longevity. Like I never even thought that I would even go there. I never thought I'd be talking about nutrition and exercise and sleep when it comes to brain health, because 20 years ago, we didn't have any evidence. We weren't taught about, about this at all. So what I'll try to do in the next five to seven minutes, I was given 21 minutes and 67 seconds. I don't know how that's possible. That's, that's 22 minutes and seven seconds. But 
I was given a short period of time to tell you everything we need to know about brain health. I'm going to try to, in the next five to seven minutes, give you an overview. And then I'd love to make this like interactive. I think we're going to do a panel. We're going to do a cool panel. panel. After your talk, so Great. Afterward. Okay, cool. So I look forward to the Q&A. Are we taking live questions from, the, from streamers? Yes. Cool. Okay, cool. Is this going to be on TikTok? I have never given a talk <laughs> since the invention of TikTok. Um, parts of it? Okay, cool. Are you the TikTok expert? I heard. I think this guy. I know. I know. That's what, that's what I mean. Whoa. Wow. Did, uh oh. I'm not sure. Um, did you say the neuron dance? That's, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> so, we'll talk about the terms Alzheimer's and prevention. Um, if I stick to the statistics, let's just stick evidence-based, the 2020 Lancet Commission, Lancet's a fancy medical journal that's like, you know, highly reputable and yada, yada, yada. The 2020 Lancet Commission says that four out of 10 cases, 40% of Alzheimer's disease, or really dementia, can be prevented if that person does everything right. Okay, that's pretty good, four out of 10. Problem is 60% of the time we may not be able to prevent it. But what if we delay it by a year, two years, three years, five years or more, and in that time frame, that blockbuster drug or whatever else comes, well then by behavior changes, lifestyle changes, innovative approaches, using technology, learning about your own biology, and then doing something about it in a targeted, precision-based way, like you mentioned, thank you, well guess what, then you've prevented your own Alzheimer's disease, just by delaying it. So, I believe that the word Alzheimer's and prevention should be used together. I don't want to make any false promises. I want to promise not to overpromise. I think that's really important. I see people in their 20s and 30s that have a gene that basically means that they're going to get Alzheimer's. It's a definitive gene. But you know what? Maybe they won't. Okay? Maybe even people with genetic changes. Genes are not your destiny. You can win the tug of war against your genes. Let's talk briefly about a gene that some of y'all may have heard about. It's called the ApoE4 variant or the ApoE4 gene. Has anyone heard about these things? So some people want to know what their genetics are. Other people don't. You can go send your genetics away. You can spit in a little tube and then it'll tell you, actually. Different companies out there can tell you. And I really believe that knowing what your genetics are, knowing your numbers of your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar levels, your body fat, your muscle mass, your waist to hip circumference, your, the list goes on and on, and then getting a cognitive baseline. When you take all these things together, that's the way that we can optimize brain health, improve longevity, and hopefully one day, more definitively prevent Alzheimer's disease. So I'll talk conceptually about how I think about health and wellness. I use the term kind of similarly. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, I'm an MD. Um, I'm just a typical person that kind of trained in the typical format. Um, I'm a anything and everything as long as it's evidence-based and safe kind of guy. That's the way I do things. Um, am I open-minded? Do I think outside the box? I think that medicine should make the box bigger. I don't think I think outside the box. I just think I listen to the evidence. Is nutrition alternative or is it that, no, nutrition's medicine. I think food is medicine. I think exercise is medicine. So the, the, the standpoint that I'm gonna come from are looking at medicine in three, way, three ways. Number one is lifespan or longevity, how long a person lives. Number two is health span, the quality of a person's life based on the medical conditions with, that they have. And then three is brain span, and brain span is a new concept. And if we can take brain span and cognitive health and cognitive optimization and we combine that with health span and lifespan, well, that's what we all want. We don't want to just live longer, we want to live better. And the focus of our work is to live longer and better with a healthy brain, okay? When it comes to precision medicine, let's talk about that for a second. Um, Mr. Jones, he may need to do this thing. He may need to do that thing. But Mrs. Smith, she's different. She may need therapies A, B, and C, but Mr. Jones, he needs therapies X, Y, and Z. And the conceptual framework here is that each person is an individual. Each person needs to know their own numbers, their own biology, when possible, know their own genetics when possible, and giving people a targeted personalized plan can lead to improved cognitive outcomes. Now, I say this now, eight years ago it was a hypothesis, and in December 2019 we published a pretty good paper. If you read it in the Wall Street Journal and CNN, it must be true, right? Yeah. 
medical journals, you know, whatever. It was reviewed in the New England Journal. It got peer reviewed there. Didn't make it through all the way process, but that's, that's the next big study. It was published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association. And what we showed in that study is that when we see people like you all from the ages of 25 to 86 with a family history of Alzheimer's and no or minimal cognitive complaints, that was our group, and you follow those people over 18 months, even people with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, mild cognitive impairment is a pre-dementia cognitive problem before the person can no longer take care of themselves. These people had amyloid in their brain, they had Alzheimer's, the pre-dementia phase of Alzheimer's, they followed an individualized approach, and as long as they followed 60% of what we told them to do in terms of lifestyle and behaviors, they had better cognitive outcomes 18 months compared to them when they, where they were at baseline. There are no drugs for mild cognitive impairment. There may be one. There's one being reviewed by the FDA soon, or actually currently, but we don't have treatments for the earliest phases of Alzheimer's. When we look at people in the prevention space, meaning people that had no cognitive complaints and either had amyloid in their brain or didn't, so primary prevention of dementia or secondary prevention of dementia, so a little, little tough terminology here, whether they followed greater than 60% of the things we told them to do or less than 60%, their cognition was better 18 months later. They were 18 months older, but their cognitive function was better. And we match these people with something, what we call age-matched historical controls. We have long databases of people where we follow cognitive function and we match people, whether we match them to the Rush cohort, the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center, their cognition was optimized. Again, full stop. It is possible to make a tangible impact on brain health and cognitive performance. We also showed significant, meaning statistically significant improvements or decreases in calculated Alzheimer's as well as cognitive, uh, as well as a cardiovascular risk. And where we want to go from here is we want to not just prove this in New York, we want to prove this in Puerto Rico. We want to prove this in Boston. We want to prove this all around the country and all around the world. And hopefully one day we'll get all, all the funding we're looking for. We have a site in the UK. We have a site in, uh, in uh, Nevada. And the goal here is to prove this across the United States and world. That's where we're going. Uh, also, some place where we want to go is wearables, using technology. Um, can we use biosensors? Can we use a wrist or a ring or a this or a that to predict cognitive function? You stole my thunder. Good job. You're hired, by the way. <laughs> we're, like, seriously. I, I, he's hired. You're, you're hired. That was, that was an impressive introduction. I was like, wait a minute. The puzzle master. Whoa, I'm going to... I'm going to steal that from you. I appreciate it because Alzheimer's prevention is a puzzle. I am literally trying to solve puzzles every day. And when we can inform that puzzle, not just with the blood tests and the blood pressure and the waist circumference and the body fat and the cognitive assessments, but also a passively collected set of information. And then I can track that, pe that person over time. I'm a, I'm a coach of a team and on my, um, this is my um, work phone, but I can track my uh, team members here, uh, meaning my team members are my patients. I see how much they're sleeping, their deep sleep, their, their REM sleep. I see what their heart rate variability is. I see what their average heart rate is. I see what their resting heart rate is. I see if they're doing high intensity interval training, if they're doing zone two training, or if they're somewhere stuck in zone three and I don't know what to do with zone three. So what I try to do with, let's say a zone three is this big thing with, I'm a zone two or high intensity kind of guy, but we can talk about that. Um, and I can track my patients. And that's the key. If we have technology and we can track these things, we should empower patients at risk for cognitive decline to be able to use their own data to personalize their um, performance. In my other pocket, I was asked about this. I, I, have a, I have a luxury vintage cell phone collection. I was asked about that today. This is the, um, the Virtu, it's from 2010, still. Prime, prime condition. Uh, this doesn't have internet access. The message I texted you earlier didn't send. I apologize, I'll send it later. Uh, but I am a Luddite and sometimes technology, eh, leave it at home too. So I wanna conclude by saying um, where the future I think is going, um, digital medicine. Um, digital medicine and digital therapeutics I think are the next frontier of where we wanna go. And you can use the fancy terms like artificial intelligence and you can use the fancy terms like big data um, and algorithms and all that. Um, I think one day, um, you know, doctors, um, there's a, uh, one geriatrician for every 1,900 older adults in the United States, okay? There's uh, projected to be, a, I think, a 
shortage of neurologists by the year 2025. Um, our population is aging, we're getting older, and we don't have the healthcare providers in, in to the degree that we need. Um, I think digital medicine and digital therapeutics is, is one of the major futures of, of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive health prevention, and um, I'm really excited about that. Um, so, um, while I could talk about exercise, nutrition, sleep, and meditation, all these different sorts of things, um, I want to just end one little bit on nutrition. Um, one of the foci that we're going to talk about, uh, I guess a lot on the panel maybe, uh, is fasting. What is the different definition? Thank you for setting me up. Uh, you know, time-restricted eating, time-restricted feeding. Fasting, you know, all these terms are thrown around, all these things are confusing. Ketones, um, I'm all about ketones and, and, and modulating ketones. Can we add exogenous ketones that we drink or eat and you add that on top of someone who's fasting to you know, boost that uh, ketosis level even more? Um, I think science and nutrition has evolved in a, in a really amazing way. And in January, I got to speak at the first ever NIH, National Institutes of Health, funded conference on precision nutrition. If you haven't heard about this, this is pretty cool. But first of all, I can't believe I got to speak at a precision nutrition conference funded by the NIH, like that doesn't make any sense because that's usually something that unfortunately our government um, is good at some things and not as good at some other things and forward thinking and nutrition, sorry, um, hasn't really um, maybe been there as much as we would like. Um, all that being said, the fact that the NIH, our government and our funding agencies are gonna be investing like a lot of money, like eight, probably nine figures or more um, into precision nutrition approaches. I think all of us in this room should be excited. I think the science behind all the things we're interested in are gonna evolve and, and really transform. So I think precision nutrition is something I could talk um, hours about. I'm happy to talk about that um, on the panel or whatever else. Um, you are what you eat when it comes to brain health. Um, but I appreciate everyone being here. Um, I appreciate your interest. And um, I want you to know that um, I'm pretty excited. Alzheimer's sucks. I have four family members with Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, your mom's suffering. I hate Alzheimer's disease. It, like, I hate it, I literally like emotionally hate it, uh, but we can do something about it. And we don't have the perfect answers and certain people can do everything right and still get Alzheimer's, I get it. I have family members that did that. Uh, but there are other people that can do everything and right, everything right and truly have a positive impact on their, on their own lives, on their own brains and the, the lives of their friends and family. So with that, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Seat up here, so we're going to do a. We're going to transition into an interactive Q and A. Uh, I do want to plug our sponsors real quick. So Daily Dose, everyone's going to get dinner tonight. I don't know if you saw, but we have uh, salmon and flank steak. So on your way out, just remember to grab your dinner. And uh, we have a brain health, brain boosting pack giveaway, uh, courtesy of Earth and Star Co. We have a variety pack from them. Coast Health, a functional NAD plus and detox shot. Daily Dose Meals, you're going to get a five-day protein fast, just what I was talking about before, uh, the fast mimicking meal plan, and uh, the bone broth sample pack. That's going to be great. I tasted it. It's delicious. And uh, Next Health Brain IV. So head over to our Instagram and uh, read how to enter. Thank you so much. And now for the Q&A. talk I was so many different questions coming up that it's hard to even know where to start were you but impressed that I hit the 21 minute and 67 second mark like on the dot yeah was, I thought was so. anyone it's impressed like it, by that it didn't, my watch no didn't timer. even go to like the 22 minute exactly. it was it was great <laughs> it's like the power it must be your phone power Thank like you. extending yeah. outwards exactly. I was sort of excited to see the alligator one but I guess yeah. uh, no alligator today but the diamond yeah. pillow that was uh, all right diamond pillow. Excellent. 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 there you go so Precision medicine, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. there's so many ways to approach this. I'm gonna start with a question that's something that's a little bit mm -hmm. shifted from what you mentioned, mm -hmm. but based on, I was reading a couple of your papers earlier today, mm -hmm. and I'm curious about the gender effect mm -hmm. when it comes to Alzheimer's. Oh, and that's yeah. something that, you know, very hot topic regardless these days, yeah. but I think it's something that there's a lot of data around, mm -hmm. and I'd love if you could talk for a little bit around both the, what we're seeing and maybe some of the underlying causes as we currently understand them. Yep, great question. So um, when it comes to precision medicine and genetics, um, we wrote our first paper on the topic in 2011, so it's been about 10 years. Um, that was like a short paper, now like a book can be written on it. When it comes to sex differences um, in Alzheimer's disease, five years ago, I could not have had a cogent conversation. I would have said, why are two out of three 
brains affected by Alzheimer's women's brains? I don't know. I think it's because women live longer and maybe something else and maybe something. And I basically would give you some gobbledygook. Um, actually, one of, the, one of the funders of our research, um, the women's Alzheimer's movement, uh, Maria Shriver has really actually been a champion for this and really pushed us forward. But she, we were doing something at some point and she was ribbing me like, well, Isaacson, go figure it out. So I can't say I figured it out, but I have colleagues that have helped me. And um, women's brains are different than men's brains. Surprise. Surprise. Women, Venus, men, Mar I don't know what the, that saying was or that book was, but women's brains are different. The perimenopause transition, um, actually a, a group uh, that I'm associated with in terms of research, has actually shown that the perimenopause transition is a key, like one of the most impactful risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. The perimenopause transition. There's age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's. The female sex and genetics, the APOE4, these are really important things. When you're a woman and you have the APOE4 variant, you're at higher risk than a man with the APOE4 variant. When you're going through the perimenopause transition, 20, 49, 50, 51, 55, whatever age, there's a biological shift. There's a bioenergetic shift of this sudden drop off of estrogen. The male andropause, some people like that term, some people don't, is totally different. It's slower, it's later, there's, not, there's nothing sudden. With women, this sudden drop of estrogen has a neurotoxic effect on the brain. Um, does hormone replacement therapy, will that help? Possibly yes, but what do you do? Is it a pill, is it a patch, is it a cream? What's the dose, what's the estradiol level? What should we check? Should we check cognitive function? Should we check brain metabolism? Should we check an estrogen receptor in the brain? These are all things that we need to figure out. But what I can tell you is that women, are in the fast lane when it comes to Alzheimer's, and I'd much rather those women be sitting in traffic. So um, that's number one. Number two, women have certain life experiences that are a little bit different. Um, you know, giving birth, for example, um, uh, motherhood and uh, having multiple children may pr be protective, but maybe not. And maybe not having any children isn't, but maybe having more than five is. These are confusing things. One study says one thing, one study says another. There's individual differences um, uh, that way too. Um, widowhood is another, another thing. Widowhood has tremendously negative impacts on the brain and you know, women are more affected by their partner dying first because men die earlier. And guess what? That is also an independent risk factor. Um, so I guess the take home point here is the answer is complicated. I think it's a mixture of uh, differences with hormones, with genetics, with other lifestyle factors. And I think women um, really need to, just like uh, you know, breast cancer was and still is a major health priority, uh, bone health, major health priority. Alzheimer's prevention and cognitive health is a major health priority for women, it needs to be. The other thing about, um, you know, there's a term called brain fog. I actually don't like that term because I'm a cognitive person and, and I, I like to say, well, is it attention? Is it speed of processing? Is it memory? Is it language? If it is memory, is it associative, logical memory, verbal memory? Sorry to get into the details here, but... Cumulonimbus or like... Cumulonimbus, uh, strata, you got it. That was, that was I, think, I think those are clouds, those clouds? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, cool, clouds. So, when it comes to brain fog and when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention and when it comes to age-related cognitive decline, there is also something about the perimenopause transition that we need to figure out. We need to take these seriously, these symptoms. Menopausal symptoms, perimenopausal symptoms, those are brain symptoms. Like, they're OB an OBGYN problem, right? That's what we think. No, those are brain symptoms. So I work with my OBGYN colleagues to try to learn about this. I talk to my OB, I call more OBGYNs than I do, I would say even cardiologists and primary care doctors, and I call those, those doctors a lot too. So when neurologists and OBGYNs start talking, um, I think uh, the field starts advancing. So I hope um, that's one of the directions we go into. That's great, so you're saying we basically need some sort of ramp to gradually cross over that shift. Yes, and, and some... you got, it. yes. If we can smooth out the perimenopause transition in specific women, so that's the key here. Some women are not going to accumulate or derive Alzheimer's risk during the perimenopause transition for reasons X, Y, and Z that are whatever. But maybe women with the APOE4 variant, maybe women with, for example, surgical menopause, when you do a hysterectomy, and you know, we don't do this much anymore, like taking out the ovaries, yikes, we used to do that all the time. Like, what a terrible thing. Yeah. That's not good for the brain, in my opinion. And you know, the studies are mostly supportive of that, maybe not entirely. 
Um, so I guess the take home point here is can we smooth it out? Um, I do believe in, again, not making any medical, uh, you know, whatever here and talk to your doctor and all that kind of thing. But I think that hormone replacement therapy, when done the right way, um, with the right agents, um, in a less is more kind of way maybe, and maybe cream or patch versus a pill, got to figure this stuff out, which specific one. Um, I do think that hormone replacement therapy has a role in uh, got it. brain health. For women. So the key takeaway here is we need to get this man some more funding to get that <laughs> yes. worked out a bit better. <laughs> Please, yeah, that's uh, it's it's tricky. But but f compared to five years ago, I could have said five percent of what I just said. That's amazing. Five years. So. Yeah. So is there some sort of hormonal component for men as well, like testosterone levels dropping off over time gradually? Yeah. Risk like is that something that we have anything on or? Yeah, this is trickier. Um, and you know, we we just did a, just did a journal club with some colleagues about um, testosterone and cognitive function and testosterone and diabetes, and we were trying to look through all the literature. Testosterone is is more complicated. I'm not sure that I can give you as a maybe five years from now. What well, we can come back and we can talk about this again. Um, but I'm not really sure. When it comes to men, um, for example, women, uh, women that have uh, elevated visceral fat, belly fat, as the belly size gets larger in men or women, the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain, gets smaller. It's just what happens. Metabolism, insulin resistance, too much sugar, fast forwards, amyloid decline. The bigger the belly, the slower the metabolism, the more insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, yada, yada. Women specifically with big bellies, or really it's more of a deposition of fat around the visceral organs and around the midsection. As the waist size gets larger in women, they have a 39% higher likelihood of developing dementia. So the toxicity of belly fat in women is possibly higher than men, but it's not great with men either. When it comes to men, and this is why I'm getting back to your question about testosterone, there is a relationship with muscle mass specifically lean muscle mass, dry lean mass, when we do the calculations in our, on our body, body composition machines. Um, so I think there is a relationship with testosterone, low testosterone, which is a loaded topic and a, and a very complicated topic to, to kind of get consensus on. But I think there's a relationship between muscle mass, testosterone levels, and it's not as clear to me about what to do about it. Um, and I think, for example, strength training in men um, especially while fasting, I think that'll come up, is imperative and um, that's a big fault of mine. I have a COVID uh, bike at home that I use and the, the post, post getting the bike I've been better, um, but you know, I don't have weights and I make lots of excuses. I should probably use body weights, but I'm, 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 I'm not, I haven't enough. But uh, keeping muscle mass, especially for men, is probably um, like really, really, really important for uh, brain health too. All right, so that brings up the, or one of the main topics at hand, mm -hmm. and this, you were discussing the impact of visceral fat. You mentioned the F word. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about <laughs> what is- Lots of F words. That's, th that's there are, yeah. I mean, there's lots of P words right, also. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then again, right. all right. So what is the impact of fasting in all of this? Like what role does it play? You mentioned visceral fat. We know, like, or at least a lot of us here have a lot of experience with it being in some way good for just overall weight management, but how does that tie into mm -hmm. the brain health perspective? Yeah. So simply put, the brain can use two different energy sources for fuel. Glucose or sugar, that's the primary fuel source for the brain, and then ketone bodies, which is the brain's backup fuel. It's a fat. It's a fat that's predominantly, um, I believe, created by the liver. When you don't have carbs, the brain needs food, the brain needs energy, and after 12 hours, a little bit more than that, the depletion of carbohydrates, if you haven't eaten any carbs or, have, or if you've been fasting, is gone, so the, the liver says, hey, uh, brain, we need some help here uh, to keep the metabolically, uh, metabolic activity, it's going to be basically running on fat. And there's good fat and bad fat. This audience knows the difference. There's good carbs and bad car carbs. This audience knows the difference. Most people don't. So if you don't know what that is, <laughs> Google it or find it out or something. Um, but in terms of fat, uh, there are protective fats. And the way that I look about um, brain and metabolism is like a hybrid car. Uh, a hybrid car has gasoline, and that's the sugar, and that causes pollution. And CO2, I'm gonna open my windows now when we cook, <laughs> thank you. Please I do, do have HEPA filters, and I do, uh, you've opened my mind to some of these things, so we'll, we'll talk about that at some point. Um, but when it comes to the gasoline sugar thing, uh, less sugar is better, I think we all agree with that. Um, sugar can cause some really nasty stuff. When it comes to the cleaner burning fuel, ketone bodies, okay, and you can do this through fasting, 
12, 13, 14 hours, I would say minimum. It starts to come up. Protective effects, maybe you need 14 to 16 hours. Maybe to have more broad effects, you need more. Maybe you can take exogenous ketones where you can take a drink, medium trained triglycerides, uh, ketone esters. There's a lot, of, a lot of different ways to do it. We have some experts here actually that can talk about this better than me. Um, but when it comes to fasting and when it comes to the hybrid car model, um, I'd rather my brain runs on ketone bodies uh, than sugar for at least X period of time a day or a week or a month or whatever it is because I think the brain is aging at a slower rate when using ketone bodies as its fuel source. Um, can I prove this? Challenging. Do ketones inc improve memory function in certain people? I believe yes. Can ketogenic diets help with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and whatever else? Um, my answer would be generally yes. Does it matter if the person has a severe dementia or severe Parkinson's versus early on, I would say it probably does matter. Does it matter if the person has a genetic variant? So for example, maybe people with the APOE4 variant could be more receptive to ketones or maybe it gets more complicated than that. Or maybe with people without the E4 are more, more um, I guess, neuroprotective benefit. So the take home point here is um, I believe in time restricted eating or time restricted feeding. Uh, minimum 12 to 14, but better 14 to 16 hours, several days a week, at least four to five, five to six even. Um, controversial, what I'm about to say, and I shouldn't say this, but uh, people that do 16 hours or more every single day, the body sometimes kind of figures it out, um, and I haven't proven this, and I have no data to support this. Is this being recorded? Um, <laughs> We can cut. You Great, know. good. Cut. It's a live stream. Um, I'm covering the microphone. Um, but those sorts of people often plateau, and maybe they need something else to kind of get there. And we recommend, well, um, I'll tell you what I do, October, November, and December, um, basically every other Saturday in October, November, and December to kind of get my whatever better I fast for 24 to 28 hours, and that's one way to kind of get things going. There are people out there that do three-day water fasts, and then people out there that do fasting and, and say, is, is black coffee okay? There's, there's a lot of complexity with fasting. I don't portend to be an expert. Um, I, I, you know, listen to a lot of smarter people than me on this. Uh, but fasting is a really good thing for brain health. It's a good thing for body health, um, but it's not exactly one size fits all, at least from my perspective. That's great. Do you have a take on the pure fat in the fasting cycle as opposed to anything that would be insulinogenic? So I guess what I would say is um, I'll go back to the kind of the doctor in me. Um, I don't think I, I, I or we have enough evidence to truly understand the idiosyncrasies here. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I did. Um, this, is, I'm not, this is not a shameless plug to try to like get me research funding. I'm not trying to say <laughs> that. We literally had a study where we were going to do 12 hours versus 16 hours, um, you know, and, and then maybe add MCTs or something to, to augment it. Doing nutrition research is A, complicated, B, it's expensive. No one wants to fund it because it's like not like pill and it's not like you can't make money off of it uh, to sell that that pill that the 12 hour fast like that's a 12 hour fast right so um, I don't think uh, we're gonna ever really have great definitive answers to these questions I'm interested in them uh, what is the minimum effective dose of a fast probably 14 to 16 hours and not 12 but I don't know for sure is it 18 is it how many days a week does it depend on the person's genetics does it depend on the person's metabolic status if they have a big belly, if they have diabetes, it's going to be probably a different answer. So that's a long-winded, round-the-block way of saying, I don't know the answer. All right. I appreciate that yeah. rather than some random answer. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The random can be fun, too. Yeah. All right. So I have so many more questions for you, mm -hmm. but I want to take a moment now and open it up to, I'm sure everyone has so many questions as All well. Right. So yeah. I saw Don. Yeah. Hand up over here. Great. Cool. Nice. How are you? Right. Great speech, guys. Question, what are you doing to neuroprotect your patients that have a history of TBI mm. um, and minimize and mitigate the risk of uh, AD? Sure. So question just so everyone oh, Traumatic heard. brain injury. Sorry. Yeah. Just to make sure everyone heard. Uh, what, is, what are we doing to try to help patients that have had a history of traumatic brain injury uh, to try to mitigate the risk of Alzheimer's or a dementia? Um, I do not have great answers to that question, again. Um, I am definitely more of an Alzheimer's prevention specialist than a TBI person. I'm a neurologist, but I haven't done as much TBI. Um, it's something I'm interested in. I've seen too many retired football players. Oof. I've seen, uh, including a 33-year-old that had enough cognitive impairment to, for them to be 53 to 63. Um, so is, there, is there a dimension not consistent with Alzheimer's, or is it, is it different? 
Great question. So does TBI cause Alzheimer's? Uh, loaded question. Um, does TBI cause, cause cognitive dysfunction? I would say sure. Um, does it cause transient cognitive function, acute, prolonged? I would say the answer is yes to all those things. Does TBI trigger Alzheimer's in a genetically susceptible individual? My answer to that has been yes, but maybe not exactly on some of the most recent data. Uh, Ten years ago, I would say that if you had the APOE4 variant and you had multiple head injuries, unless you had a whole lot of omega-3s to be protective, to create synapses, unless you had a, you know, uh, some degree of you know, recovery between multiple head injuries, so the brain can at least recover a little bit, um, I think I would have said TBI could trigger an Alzheimer's like picture and now I'm glad I'm saying like picture because the Alzheimer's that I was seeing wasn't exactly an Alzheimer's. Is that chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Is that a tau protein? Is that an amyloid protein? Is it uh, a mishmash of things? Is it diffuse axonal injury which is a problem with the cables of when a thought goes point, from point A to point B? Is it the white matter, the gray matter? Is it The take home point with all of this is I can use a bunch of gobbledygook words but multiple head injuries um, can trigger all sorts of funky pathologies in the brain and it's like an atypical Alzheimer's-like dementia, but it may not be exactly Alzheimer's. So what do you do to prevent that? Uh, prevent head injuries. <laughs> Here we go, uh, uh, helmets. Um, uh, my nephew, Bobby, uh, was a football player. He asked me, should he be playing football? I said, um, I, I like football, I think it's cool, but just protect your head, just be, be smart. Um, I think uh, whether you're whatever age almost, I'm not a pediatric person, but whether you're younger-ish or 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond, before someone develops cognitive decline, omega-3 fatty acids can create synapses, omega-3 fatty acids, specifically DHA, do docosohexanoic acid, whatever it is. Uh, DHA plus a little bit of EPA, 2,000 milligrams of DHA has been shown to uh, uh, probably be protective against Alzheimer's, but only or more so in the APOE4 positives. And people with APOE4 can't absorb or really uh, collect uh, the, the amount of DHA that they need, so we have to kind of give them you know, mega doses of 2,000 milligrams, which is not a mega dose, but that's a whole different discussion. So take on point here is um, prevention with head injury is helmets, uh, fatty fish, lake trout, mackerel, herring, wild salmon, I'm okay with tuna in moderation, um, sardines for sure. Uh, I add in omega-3 fatty acid supplementation. Certain people, we check omega-3 levels. Um, we use an at-home test. Um, that's pretty convenient and helpful. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't know the answers exactly. I think I think there's some other stuff, and I'm not exactly sure. We got another question over here. Hey guys, great so far. Thank you very much. Do you, um, kind of piggybacking Avisha, is there any environmental areas or specific countries that have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. Number one. And number two, is there, uh, you had mentioned like mammography studies. Is there any brain studies mm -hmm. that you would recommend from a preventative standpoint, such as like SPECT scans or anything like that? Great. Okay, cool. So I think maybe we can tag team the first question because um, the stuff that you said today, I wish I knew more about, and it's like a shame that I don't. My brain can only hold so much information, but uh, 10 years ago, I would have never said that air pollution definitively caused Alzheimer's disease. I would have said, I don't know that that's really definitive. But a couple of years ago, the study came out that showed, you're going to hear this again, broken record, people with the APOE4 variant who had high exposures to DDT yeah. and then DDE, for example, that's a pesticide, uh, you know, in the soil, that fast forwards Alzheimer's, but only in APOE4 positive. So then I said, okay, pesticides, air pollution, toxins, okay, let me, let me look into this. And then the study showed that if you live near a highway, especially underprivileged people, low socioeconomic classes, you live near a highway, whether you're E4 or not, I believe, you're at increased risk of, of dementia and cognitive decline. So um, I'll stop there, but um, for when it comes to toxins, pollutants, environmental concerns, um, yes. Ten years ago, I would say, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's, and that study with DDT, there's been multiple other studies now looking at several other very commonly sprayed pesticides that both directly and based on the VOCs that they produce in some of the breakdown processes also have similar sorts of neurological damage. Okay. So absolutely, there's going to be geographic determiners there. Of course, to Rudy's question also, I would assume that there's some type of geographic, at least from a country level, breakdown yeah. in terms of APOE representation. Like, yeah. I would... Be, I haven't seen that data, but I'm sure that would be very interesting to look at. Yeah, so um, 
We'll start with APOE and regional differences. African Americans with the APOE4 variant are at lower risk. Okay, let me, let me finish this because it's confusing because African Americans overall, as well as Hispanic Americans, are at a much higher risk of Alzheimer's and Caucasians. And it's complicated why. There's health equi equity aspects, there's all sorts of aspects, education, there's other vascular risk factors. So that's a whole very complicated web to, web to unweave. But African Americans specifically that have the APOE4 variant are not as impacted by that APOE4 as opposed to, for example, Caucasian Americans. That's interesting. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's like, for example, in India, there's less, heard this, there's less in India because people eat curry and, and turmeric. Well, that's totally true. And in the areas of India that the socioeconomic status goes up and they adopt the Western style diets, the incidence of Alzheimer's approximates that in the United States. So yes, there are regional differences, there's um, genetic differences, there's nutritional differences. Um, teasing this out in different parts of the world is complicated though. Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's right. Right. Totally. Yeah. I have a question um, and we'll pass the mic down afterwards. Um, with all the latest and greatest research in the gut microbiome and those gut bacteria like that are good for you, how does that affect um, the development of Alzheimer's? Oof. You're about to hear a bunch of I don't knows, um, but I really want to know. Um, is there a relation? Funding for him. Yeah. Um, this is not, no shameless plugs for funding, I promise. That's my job. That's not why I'm here. Oh, great. You're hired. Great. <laughs> What'd you call it? The puzzle piece? Puzzle, puzzle, puzzle master. master. Puzzle master. Man, this guy's hired. Um, gosh. So here we go again. I'm going to sound like a broken record. We tried to do a study on this. We had the funding and then the company like, you know, went out of business or something. So our our, our microbiome testing kits uh, in, in evaporated into the air. Uh, it was. Uh, so we'll talk about Yeah, that's a whole, my uh, sad. I had a whole. Uh, I have a lot of those kits. I had a, yeah, I had a whole team that worked on this for a year and a half and like IRB gets approved and one month later, anyway. Uh, so I would love to study the microbiome. Um, you know, is it black L. bulgaris? Is it this, is it that? I mean, I don't know. Is it, are, are, there mic, are there microbiomial agents that are related to metabolism that then have a cascade effect on Alzheimer's? Uh, sure, is it, you know, P. gingivalis, well those are, that's the bacteria in the mouth, is that, like there is so much about microbiomial everything. We can add in viruses, which I'm not gonna go into, but herpes virus and HIV and amyloid and there's a whole loaded discussion here, but whether it's microbiome or microbials in general, um, you know, uh, this is real. People can be on a amyloid road, a genetic road, a microbiomial road, a, a, a women, a, a female road during the perimenopause transition. Different people can take different roads to Alzheimer's. I don't understand the microbiome as well as I need to. You know, fermented foods and probiotics and prebiotics, and I wish I could have you know, um, an entire research program, not that I would lead because my hands are full, but I wish we could have like a microbiomial research center for Alzheimer's disease that could study these things and in three to five years we'd have more answers. Um, supporting the microbiome, of course, and do you, you know, do you eat, you know, yogurt with the act, live and active cultures, grass-fed, of course. Do you do this? Do you do, I have no idea, but um, I'm interested in the topic. So with your Alzheimer's patients, are you not taking a look at their stool and their gut microbial composition, trying to see if one particular bacteria, bacterium is more prevalent. I had an entire plan to do this and it, um, you know, for example, fecal transplants, right? Fecal transplants, like, sound weird, sound science fiction, not for this group, but probably <laughs> for, yeah, not for you, you guys are, you guys are swapping poop in the bathroom over there. I was asked to be a donor. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> he's the donor. Masks on in the bathroom, please. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot to this and I, I, um, you know, you know, fecal transplants for Alzheimer's prevention. Could that be a thing? I, I like, yeah, it could be. I'm not sure when, and I don't got the bandwidth and, uh, but I, 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 there's something there. There's something there. I, you know, it's not just about genetics. It's not just about what people eat, it's about what lives inside of us. So there's a, this is complicated. And that's why we need to take that shift away from the humans doing all the work and mm. get all these, like the microbiome especially, yeah. is such a multifactorial data set yeah. that if we can combine that with all the different like crazy blood markers and stuff and feed that into a nice 
predictive system that can actually try to work that out. Yeah. That really is the next step in approaching all of this. Like, yeah. no human should have to go pour over the names of all the bacteria and try and see, oh, this yeah. is associated with that. It just won't work. Yeah, and, you know, we tried. We tried that. So any t you have to walk before you can run, right? And we had some of these microbiome kits. We, we this was this was all part of the plan, 2017, 2018, and then we got the funding, we got the IRB approval, and then you know kaput. So um, and you need large data sets, lots of variability. Is it mouth? You know, do you check it in the saliva? Do you check it in the like? These are really complicated things. All right, we have a question over here. Cool. So I'll love your energy, just in general, I have to say that. No um, belt? I'm not, look at this shirt, he's got the solar no, system is, on his shirt. Avish is a vibe in, a, in and of uh, itself. Okay. Avish is a total vibe. <laughs> um, first of all, I, my business partner in my um, anxiety venture is Dr. Robert Kochko. So when you were talking about, that, oh. <laughs> when you were talking about um, precision that. That nutrition amazing. and medicine, I'm like, Cornell? I'm like, they, they must be friends. They must oh, have worked he, together very he, closely. I mean, he, uh, I'll be, uh, I don't know, sorry to give shout outs, but Dr. Kochko, uh, He's, he's like w way wise beyond his years. He's beyond. When yeah. I met him, he was, I'm like, how old is this person? How does he know these things? It was like a very strange thing. But, but Robert, is, he's, on all, he's on our research papers. He's yeah, part exactly. part of our studies. Um, he's a naturopathic doctor. He's on the board of uh, the Naturopathic Physicians yeah, he's the Organization. He, yeah, young guy, but he just know, he's an encyclopedia. And he's taught me, uh, you know, again, I'm a MD that right, learns classically what, trained what MD. I kind of learned. And, and Robert, we honestly could not have done what we did it takes a village and it took like uh, 16 of us in that room discussing cases every week. And he was one of our 16 of the, kind of the, the greatest hits of, of the people that figured out that. the puzzle or trying to anyway of Alzheimer's prevention. Yeah, and so. of course, you know, Andrew worked with him too, um, uh, as well on cool, a, cool, cool. a company also related to um, helping people with chronic pain using social interactions um, yeah. as being a driver of that. But when cool. you're literally saying precision medicine, I'm like, Rob, I'm like, this oh, has to yeah. be related. Yeah, um, we, yeah. We, 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 care for some cool patients that he's helped a lot. So. Absolutely. Um, and he, I, I, my practice, both my prior practice and my um, anxiety proof program, we're, we're partners. And cool. okay. uh, I just was like, awesome. there's an energetic thing here. So I had said, um, I was a dietitian in nursing homes treating advanced Alzheimer's patients okay. for years, but left, completely left Western nutrition because of exactly what I was seeing. So mm -hmm. really like giving, you actually, when you're working in nursing homes for people who don't know, you actually have to like justify when clients lose weight that you're putting an intervention in place as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. The intervention is Ensure, which is literally like high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated soybean oil. And I literally would be, go to sleep at night. Like I would like put it on their tray and then I would like go to the kitchen and say, make them a smoothie. Like I can't, like yeah. I was so debilitated about it yeah. because our our healthcare system is so broken when it comes to Alzheimer's probably like the my in my opinion like yeah. the most just the way that people are treated too so this is like a high level concept question what would you say is like the first thing if you could recommend and like pull a solution out of your hat for our healthcare system in the yeah. treatment of Alzheimer's what would you say I know it's laughable but this is a fun dream question dream. yeah um well I mean yeah, well, well, listen, I mean, exercise, nutrition, I mean, I, I mean, I could, there's a lot, but um, I, I think if people felt empowered to take control of their own health just a little bit, um, listen, our healthcare system's totally messed up, and I don't pretend to have any mag magic solutions. Um, I have empathy for doctors, um, like I, like most doctors get 15 minutes per patient and have to deal with like the lungs and the liver and the what, oh, oh, and the brain too, and Alzheimer's prevent, yeah, good luck, like I have, a lot of empathy, um, you know, um, some patients, um, uh, you know, are citizen scientists, they try to learn about their health, and I have empathy for patients because they can't even find doctors that are, you know, or, or, or healthcare practitioners that are, you know, addressing all the things that need to be addressed. Um, you know, know your numbers would be the first thing. I think everybody, whether you're a, a, a you know, a, a lay person or some medical training or whatever, if everyone knows their blood pressure, Everyone knows their, like, I don't know, waist circumference, cholesterol. 80, 32 over 28. Per perfect, exactly. And, and that if we can change this concept of the you know, normal reference ranges of labs, like, like when I was in med school, a normal fasting blood sugar was 125. Like 124 was normal, 125 was borderline. No, that's pre-diabetes. Then I graduated med school, it was 116. Oh, oh yeah, one. 116, you're pre-diabetic. Now it's 100. Well, okay, that's getting closer, but a fasting blood sugar of 95 and above does have negative memory outcomes. So 
I think our healthcare system is stuck on this whole concept of averages, and it's okay to be the averages of sick people. You got it. And it's it's there's normal, and then there's optimal. And if our healthcare system pushed more towards optimal, you know, just I'm going to quote a study that that should have made global groundbreaking news, but didn't. It was published in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, but didn't didn't make as much big news. There's something that anyone can do today to reduce their chance of developing mild cognitive impairment by 19% within three years. Okay, 19% reduction of the first symptomatic stage of Alzheimer's. Everyone in here can do it. Blood pressure control. The only thing they did differently was the, the normal range or the, what that they looked for was 140s over 80s or they jacked it up to try to, the meds or whatever else, lifestyle changes to get the blood pressure to the 120s over 70s or below. All you had to do in three years, they stopped the study early, okay? In three years, just getting your blood pressure to a more normal or optimal range of less than 120s over 70s, as opposed to 140s over 80s, which most doctors say, ah, it's fine, just go exercise more, eat less salt. Just reducing that alone, that one intervention delayed the likelihood or, or reduced the likelihood of developing MCI by 19%. So the take home point, I guess I would say to how to fix the healthcare system is, I have no idea. No, um, I just when you say it like that, it sounds preposterous, but I think people have to take control of their health and we have to redefine what's normal, abnormal, and we should shoot for optimal. Like, like I don't want to be average. I don't want to see on my test. That's 140 over 80. I want an A plus and that's 108 over you know 62. My fasting heart rate, I bet yours is you know, yeah, probably low 40s over here, right? Um, low to mid 40s. Yeah, low to mid 40s. Like I think that's normal, but like the p normal pulse ranges for people is 60 to 100. Like how does someone have a pulse, a resting pulse of 90 and be healthy? Like I don't understand how that can be possible. It's called resting anxiety. Rest yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, or a lot of caffeine. Uh, but yeah, that's how I would maybe say to define it. I had one more little tiny thing too, which I thought was really cool. I talked about my aunt who has um, stage four glioblastoma, and uh, we I pushed so hard for them to test every single genetic mutation, and she has like a one percent one, which is like a BRAF mutation, which is really cool because they can give her BRAF inhibitors for it, which cool. is like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Um, they would never have done this test two years ago, so it's just unbelievable precision yeah. medicine and what a difference it's going to totally. make in her lifespan. It's it's like absolutely insane. Totally different, yeah. and. and Cancer precision medicine, like that's like normal. Alzheimer's in precision medicine, there's still no one's talking about that. It's just, it's just yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> uh, it's like like seven of us now, not twelve of us. Uh, Parkinson's in precision medicine, um, like we are. We hope to start the first Parkinson's prevention clinic uh, in the country, like in the coming months. Um, so, neurodegenerative disease precision medicine. I'm sure you know about this, but um, ketosis and ketogenic diet for glioblastoma. Um, uh, Lou Cantley has done a lot of work on this. And the issue is that her mutation is oh. on keto. Okay. Actually, so that oh. was very happy to find. That was what I was well, like, I was very happy to find that out. Precision because, medicine. Um, I, yeah. I hire a precision nutrition team who specifically only does yeah. uh, glioblastoma. They're, they like eat fruits and like glioblastoma. Yeah. We kept with a second found mutation. They were like, stop ketosis because it actually eats on ketosis. Gotcha. That's why precision medicine is the future. Yep. Yep. Great. I cite that paper all the time when people just start recommending ketosis as like the blanket cancer solution. It's like it's really good for the majority, but be careful because sometimes it can be the. Uh, yeah. wearables and biotech. I was wondering if you um, played with the lumen at all, which helps you understand whether you're in ketosis or not, and whether you're, you know, feeding on... Is that the blow thing that turns blue Yeah, or so the lumen is one, and the other was around the continuous glucose monitoring. Yeah. Um, if you have any anecdotal or evidence-based. Yeah, so um, so I have a patient who's a cardiologist, an e 4 apoe 444 super cool guy, great guy, taught me a lot. Um, who used the, uh, the first keto monitor. I, w I don't know if it was Lumen or not. I have another guy, or actually two. I have three, three guys. I don't know why all men have done it, but um, have all tried the ketone uh, monitor. We're nerds. Uh, nerd, yeah, the nerds, exactly. Um, so I don't, I can't say, because I don't have enough experience, my N3, but um, I think it may be helpful for them. Um, the ketone strips in the urine, they're expensive and, you know, whatever else, and you can do ketosis, you know, the little finger pricks, but um, I mean, you know, 
it's good to know if you're in ketosis, I mean, it's, it's, so you can understand, you know, maybe even do it for a short period of time. So I would say, mm -hmm. right. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, supp I've, I, every time someone said they were, they should, they were interested in, I roll with it, and if it helps you, great, and teach me, sort of thing. Um, when it comes to um, continuous glucose monitoring, um, I'm a neurologist. It's very weird when I'm calling pharmacies to prescribe these things, um, but I do in a handful of times. I refuse to because of my scope of practice, and I'm trying to be conservative, and I'm already like ordering preventative cardiology panels and calcium CAT scans and. Agatson scores, and Dr. Agatson's taught me a lot, the calcium guy, calcium score guy, South Beach diet guy too, but great guy. Um, I'm trying to stay within my lane, but I, I haven't been able to. So I have called in a few continuous glucose monitors. I try to have the primary care doctor and maybe endocrinologist. Most endocrinologists I send people to. This is not a dig on endocrinology, but a, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.4 is fine and go exercise more. And that stuff drives me crazy. So yes, um, and I have my little, um, I won't say if I'm a free Libre or a Dexcom a guy or gal, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of them and I have one of the apps on my phone and I track my patients and I get the blips and it's annoying in the middle of the night. And then I call the patient and I say, what's up? Another acai bowl? Yes, another acai bowl. I thought acai bowls were, were healthy and I'm like, acai, acai, acai. acai. <laughs> yeah. I got this one guy who just loves the acai bowls and there's, there's granola in it. So of course it's even healthy. It slows to, no, look, why is your blood sugar 220? What is going on? So, um, yes, I'm all about, um, and you know, not in everybody. And does someone really need to wear it like for months and months and months? Like, I don't know after, you know, I, I usually give one refill, um, you know, like, like, uh, two 30 day periods or a couple 10 day periods here and there. You know, I don't know that everyone needs to wear it constantly, but yes, if, if resources weren't a problem uh, and people are, are digging it, then sure. Do you ever get that actually covered by insurance for that sort of indication? So um, uh, I tell patients that I, uh, if a prior authorization comes, it's just not my wheelhouse. Um, I don't think they're as expensive as I thought. I think it's like 160 for something, another hundred or two. So actually it's cheaper than I anticipated, but it's, you know, several hundred bucks. Yeah. One more time for hyper hyperglycemia. Okay, gotcha. Cool. You have a question? Yeah. So uh, uh, this is great talk. Great information. It's great that Alzheimer's is now getting that precision nutrition medicine feel, which it should have a long time ago. Which kind of leads into my question. Okay. Um, I'm a physician in Manhattan. I deal a lot of patients who are unfortunately dealing with Alzheimer's, myocardial impairment, and so on. Right. Who unfortunately the medicines for that field have failed miserably or don't work well at all um, compared to other medicines for other neurological issues. Yeah. And my question is, and again, you're definitely on the bandwagon, is with all the things coming down on, I mean, I studied chemical weeks ago, sleep and leading, poor sleep leading to dementia and mm. mitochondrial dysfunction and leaky blood brain barrier and butyrate and so on and methylene yeah. blue and so on. Yeah. What is it, I mean, I try to implement this. Yet there are some studies, some of the studies have not done in large cohort double blinded studies yet. They're coming down when we get the funding. Um, right. But anyway, yeah. what is it going to take to turn the slow moving truck ship around here mm -hmm. to for something that's going to be become a larger proponent of our population as the population gets older mm -hmm. to lead to things again, like everything from a CGM to working on the mitochondria to Again, sleep wearables. What is it going to take to make that part of the, the medical education? I know the rule is 20, 23 years before something becomes yeah. real to teaching doctors how to do it. Doctors yeah. are the slowest moving 20, people I, on the planet. I, I usually quote 15 from the Institutes uh, of Medicine, but it okay. feels more like 20 to 25. Definitely. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what is it going to take? Um, funding. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more, it's actually, I don't even know if funding will do it. Um, I gave this lecture to a group of, uh, let's just say, influential Canadians, I'll just say it like that, an amazing group interested in longevity. It was one of the coolest, not, I mean, you guys are my faves, of course, but these longevity guy, guys and gals from Canada were, were a lot of fun too. Um, it's going to take, and, and these folks never heard a lot of what I was talking about. And, and some of these people have enough resources to um, do whatever they want, and they can have their planes, and they can have their trains, and they can do whatever. but you know, and they're treated by the best doctors and they're sitting at a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3 and their blood pressure, why is your blood pressure 160s over 80s and you actually check it and your doctor doesn't say anything? Again, not a dig at the doctors necessarily because maybe it's a time issue, maybe it's whatever. It's gonna take these types of influential people, I think, to step up and say, we're doing this all wrong. You know, like, 
uh, Warren Buffett and Amazon and whatever else, they tried to like fix healthcare and they hired Atul Gawande and okay, they went out of business a few months ago, great. Um, that they tried, that didn't work. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. Um, I can tell you I was reading an article yesterday out of the UK that a 74 year old, I, I think he must be well known in, in the UK, but I didn't know him, Sir Tony Robinson, or I, don't, I forget what his name is, but he basically is now a proponent for living a healthy lifestyle for dementia prevention. And I don't see that much of that. You know, Seth Rogen and Lauren, Ro Lauren Miller Rogen, um, really great people, supporters of our work too. They have a, a foundation. Um, they talk about that a lot. I think it's going to take uh, young people to talk about the things that they're doing for their brain health. And I think it's going to be taking um, powerful people to, at some point, just like instead of like investing in, instead of investing in Bitcoin or Hitcoin, how's Hitcoin? 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 Yeah. <laughs> instead of investing in, you know, the next big thing to make them rich, just take some money and park it in some sort of like longevity initiative. And, and, and science back, but also like forward thinking and you know patient facing. Um, to say I did this. I feel better. I look better. My numbers are better. Uh, and you guys can do it too. And I, I think it's going to take strategic investments from people with an, a, a notoriety and, and, and people that are public figures. Take up the mission here. Base, yeah, yeah. And you know there there are. I can see I, it. Biohackers. Yeah, yeah, and there, there's there's a, there's there's a fair amount of them out there that haven't become public, um, and you see these people on TV, you see these people in movies, you see these people whatever, but uh, none of the big names yet have kind of gone public and said, "I'm doing this. Why why aren't you?" You know, I think one other aspect there though is going to be the other side of the tech coin. Mm -hmm. Right now, Apple with the Apple Watch, like the next version is going to have a continuous glucose monitor on it. No. Yeah. Really. Passive? Non passive, non invasive. Oh, I don't know. They're actually working on basically like. Sp sp <laughs> <laughs> like sp using spectro <laughs> spectroscopy. Yeah. They're able to go and actually get a pretty good sense of continuous glucose just uh -huh. with a non invasive wearer. Wow. And that's something that will then create a data set. Well. hooked into a company that has mm. the ability to actually process it using the right tools right. that will produce a lot. And right. when it comes to barriers to entry, suddenly if right. it's just the same thing they're wearing anyway, right. that's going to be really big. Yeah, wow. I think the next Samsung watch is they're going to be able to do continuous glucose monitoring. And also, I think wow. that was on the docket for Apple watches as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a question over here. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Mary Lee. I'm the nurse practitioner at Next Health. Oh, cool. So just fascinating. Hey. Everything that you were talking about is cool. literally what we're doing. <laughs> um, so Next Health has been around in California, but we're finally new to the East Coast. So I feel like a lot of people just don't know what we're about, but we're a health optimization and longevity center. Great. So for example, yeah. like I was Western medicine. Yeah. We liked vitamin D around 30, 30-ish. 30. 30 yeah. We're 60 to 80. Yeah. We want you I'm, optimum. I'm 50 to 70 for, so, for brain health. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's just interesting. Like yeah. that's what our goal is, and we actually do bioidentical hormone replacement pelleting. Right. Um, a lot of our menopausal patients are benefiting from it, and we're hoping that it prevents Alzheimer's right. um, as well. There's some research out there, right. but just wanted to. I mean, bioidentical hormone therapy. Have you? I knew you might, we don't like the patches, we don't like the lotions because of absorption and yeah, it's kind I of a mean, roller coaster ride effect. Well, so um, I hate to say it again, but I don't know. There's the, an the answer is in here somewhere. Um, there are um, many ways to fry an egg. Um, I wish I knew the correct way in this sense. Um, you know, personally, I, I, I start low and go slow. Uh, uh, you actually, uh, we do start with uh, the creams and, 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 and the patches, uh, for example. Uh, for example, if again, I'm a neurologist, but I ask about um, uh, vaginal dryness, like, like if that's a problem with estrogen, like we should use local, you know, like why stick someone on a pill? So, so I ask a lot of questions and I try to start low and go slow. And then we, we track estradiol. We, we try to get it like, I don't know, 75 to 100. I'm not sure that's right. but. I don't know, I also look at the cognitive function. If the cognitive function is doing better and the woman doesn't have symptoms anymore of perimenopause, then I'm going to stick them there. So I wish I knew, you know, is it the pellet, is it the, this? I, I, I just, I don't know. And you say that because uh, one of the first symptoms that patients improve on is brain, uh, yeah. like brain fog sure. is gone and they yeah. have more brain clarity. Yes. So it's just uh, very, very interesting. Yeah. Perimenopause is a neurologic disease, but people don't know that. So cool. Thanks. Great to meet you. 
Sure. I'm, I'm cool. a dietitian at Princeton Longevity Center. Cool. We just opened up here in New York, so that's awesome. Cool. Um, I was wondering, so it's cardio preventative uh, center. We do calcium scoring, Great. Uh, full body scans, all that cool. lovely jazz. Great. And yeah. I have a very significant family history of heart disease. Gotcha. Uh, my father passed away a month after he turned 39 of a heart attack. Yeah, I mean, he was 40, but he just had turned 40 yeah. a month prior. My yeah. grandfather has passed away, all of, everyone in his yeah. family. So uh, the cardiologist that I work under is like, yeah. you know, you're still young, you're only 26. We can, yeah. you know, start kind of monitoring you at 30. Have you seen a risk of like oh. people who are predisposed to cardiovascular uh, just incidents and disease yeah. with Alzheimer's? And how early do you start really oh, looking yeah. at people like me? <laughs> yeah, so um, apoliproprotein E4 is a lipoprotein yeah. gene. It's a cholesterol gene. Mine's still good, so. <laughs> and it caught, and, it, and it, it's a, yeah. it's an Alzheimer's gene. So cholesterol, yeah. people can be on the cholesterol road. It's, it's, it's a cholesterol based plus lifestyle disease. Um, we look at E4s and everybody, we use a preventative cardiology panel. That's Dr. Agatson actually, um, kind of trained me in 2001 when I was an intern in South Beach randomly, yeah. uh, amazing guy, <laughs> taught me a lot. Um, he, uh, kind of just impressioned upon me about using advanced cardiovascular measures that I've been using for over a decade, 12, 13 years now. Uh, and it seems like every year another cardiology measure predicts if someone's going to have vascular cognitive decline. Um, you know, for someone like you, um, you know, probably 25 and up is a pretty reasonable way to start. I have a research coordinator um, that got his labs and his LP little a was through the roof. Uh, well, we're going to have LP little a treatments one day, but until we do, we better get the LDL and the APOB and everything else um, in, in better shape. Uh, I believe in, you know, as a person overproducer and overabsorber of cholesterol, if you're an overproducer, maybe low dose statins, maybe not, E4, confusing, desmosterol, plant sterols, can we use omega 3s? I mean, management of cholesterol is a loaded question, and we can argue, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. I'm an APOB kind of person, but we look at LP little a and, and a variety of other things. We look at inflammatory markers. All I can say is, um, it's never, too, is 22 too young? No, I mean, like, our 22 year old research coordinator found something that he really had to take seriously. Um, and we have PCSK9 inhibitors now, we have bempedoic acid, whatever that's called, we were gonna have LP little a treatments. So the precision approach, not precision due to genetics, but the precision meaning targeted approach towards uh, cardiovascular health is gonna overlap quite similarly with uh, Alzheimer's, yeah. Yeah, sure. So I have a question for you in terms of some potential takeaways. Sure. If I were someone who is interested in preventing my risk of ever getting Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. say that I'm APOE 4434, something that puts mm -hmm. me at higher risk, but mm -hmm. maybe even not, and I have $300 to spend, and you could say, what do you do? Okay. Um, uh, take a free course online, shameless plug, but totally free, Alzheimer's Universe, ALZU.org. Uh, totally free. All right. Uh, some of the, you know, Flash expired, so some of the lessons aren't working. <laughs> Apologize. Yeah, Adobe Flash, you know, old, old days. It was created a few years ago, the course. Uh, start by that. No, no, just get, get educated, get informed. Uh, we have papers out there about what to do if you're E4 positive versus negative. We've written on this. Mediterranean style diet, anti-smoking, you know, no smoking, uh, less alcohol or no alcohol probably for E4s. Uh, optimizing vitamin D even more actually, um, you know, maybe closer to 70. Um, and um, omega-3 fatty acids. So if you have $300, um, nothing to disclose. There's a company called Omega Quant. Uh, you can order online. Uh, Bill Sanford created the red blood cell omega qu uh, test. Uh, get an Omega Quant test, figure out how much your omega-3s are. You can also check your vitamin D uh, using that test. Uh, that's a hundred, you can do the cheaper one or the more expensive one, that's a hundred bucks, 150, whatever. Do you have a preferred three, six ratio? Or? Uh, you're, you know, <laughs> you know, you know the right questions to ask. Um, it's not a common question I get. Um, I'm a th three to one or less. Nailed it. Yeah. I mean, that was my last number. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Th uh, listen, if we can get 2.5 to one, let's have a party, but three to one, I'm, I'm pro omega sixes, but I'm more pro omega threes and you need to kind of get the ratios and these are confusing. Uh, like the fact that like our, what is our, what is our normal, like in, in the population, like five to one or something like more, Significantly it's just more it's like eight to one complete, or com com 20, oh yeah, God, 15, that's just 20, it's insane. It's, it's, anyway, uh, how about, okay, so $150, um, gosh, do you get a wearable? I mean, I, I don't know, um, yeah, see your doctor, pay your copay, <laughs> find a doctor that will check your labs, I don't know, um, 300 is better than zero.
Is there any other lab panel other than the like, cholesterol in D or than the omegas in D that you would really? Yeah, um, we use Boston Heart. Nothing to disclose. Um, you know, I like the Boston Heart panel. We use it in our research, so I like it. Um, but I don't. I don't know. There's. There's. It's hard. It's hard. Okay, I think cool. we have time for maybe one last question. And that. Did we want to take any questions from the viewers, or I, I is if, if, we're, if that's really uh, not going? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, we won't deal with the technical issues <laughs> involved. I got a text from someone who's watching. No questions. Yet. They're yeah, not. So they're not supportive of my haircut. I did this myself <laughs> two weeks that's ago. Fantastic. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Two. Five, no, I made a mistake. And it's grown back now, so someone has noticed that. But aside from that, I have no, no text question. So. All right. That cool. is impressive. Okay. All right, so I think we're going to wrap so, it up here. OK, great. All right. Thank All you so right. much. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Cool.